So with that introduction, uh, I'm going to ask our first speaker to come online. Uh, he is James Goodman. He's a postdoctoral scientist um, at the German Primate Center. The title of his talk is Group Specific Dynamics Are Not Shared Between Action and Observation in the Frontoparietal Cortical Grasping Network. Thank you. Welcome, uh, James. All right, let's get started. Uh, in our lab, we are interested in hand movements and the frontoparietal cortical grasping network that enables them. Work from our lab and others has demonstrated that this network performs the critical task of taking visual information about objects and gradually converting that into a movement plan as those signals progress from AIP to F5 to M1. However, another major line of research in this network involves how neurons in these areas respond during the mere observation of action, responses which are thought to indicate a sort of motor simulation. We sought to apply population analysis to this thread of grasping research, which to date has been scarce. Uh, to this end, we trained monkeys to perform a grasping task in two different contexts, uh, memory guided, uh, which is in the dark, and visually guided in the light. We also trained animals to hold still and watch a human experimenter grasp the same object. We presented a wide variety of different objects to elicit different grips, and we used floating microelectrode arrays to record from the three major nodes of the frontoparietal network. And the neurons we recorded across these areas exhibited a wide variety of different preferences for action and observation. Uh, shown here are peri-event time histograms of two example neurons showing high selectivity for one or the other, uh, representing the range of responses we see across these areas. And uh, the first thing we do to try and get a handle on this is we use just principal components analysis to visualize the activity of this diverse population of neurons in state space. Uh, we see when we do this that AIP exhibits robust activity across all three tasks, and as we progress further along the visuomotor hierarchy, we gradually see that the red observation component shrivels away, consistent with what we would expect. Uh, while these plots tend to highlight the differences between these tasks. Uh, we also see when using demixed principal components analysis, a substantial overlapping component between action and observation in F5 and AIP. However, an ideal test of motor simulation should come in the form of common object representations rather than merely a common activity pattern that doesn't vary with any of the experimental conditions. Indeed, we should expect that if we classify grip type using neural activity recorded during movement, we should be able to use the same readout to determine those same grips during observation and vice versa. So we run a uh, cross-classification analysis uh, in this vein, comparing each pair of tasks at all possible pairs of epics and timings. And we end up with these heat maps detailing each and every one of those pairwise cross-classification performances. This is a lot to take in, so I want to draw your attention to two things. One, how an M1 cross-classification is high between the two grasping tasks during the movement itself, but not anywhere else. And two, how an F5 cross-classification is high between different tasks and epochs uh, generally, except when you consider when moving is, movement is occurring during the observation task. Uh, in general, across all areas and in two animals, we fail to see high cross-classification accuracy when comparing action and observation. But okay, this is all a very representational framework. What if we consider a complementary dynamical systems framework of neural activity? One where we, use, for example, use linear regression to fit the firing rates and their derivatives in state space, and ultimately determine how well the dynamics of one task explain activity in the other. How similar are action and observation in this framework? In fact, they remain quite dissimilar. 
uh, if we build the same pairwise heat maps that we did for classification, only this time using R squared instead of classification accuracy as our measure of goodness of fit, we see that in both M1 and F5, there is high congruence between the two grasp tasks, but again, poor fits when comparing action and observation. Again, this pattern holds across cortical areas and animals. In conclusion, we fail to see any indication of grip congruence between action and observation activity, whether we used a representational or a dynamical systems perspective. This would seem to argue for at least one of three possibilities, one where there is simply no motor simulation being recruited in this context, one where the shared representation of action concerns features that are more abstract than the specific grips, and one where there exists some distinct simulation subspace, which avoids, for, for example, executing unwanted movements. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and invite you to ask any questions. Thank you, James. That was on point and beautiful graphics, um, I have to say. And uh, we are waiting for questions to show up on the uh, Q&A side of things. I would, if, if you don't mind, I would like to start with a couple of questions. Um, sure. One is the idea of, you were talking about your model. Uh, are these uh, primates already trained in these tasks or is this just the first time that they're interacting with these uh, groups? Uh, they are well-trained in this task. Oh, we're not looking at anything resembling say motor learning uh, with this process. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're hyper-trained on these tasks. They're grasping these objects pretty much every day. <laughs> so, so would you expect that if, there, if this was more about learning aspects of it, that there, you, may, you may be able to see more of a congruence between action and observation? Uh, perhaps, admittedly, we don't really have the data to assess that claim. Uh, it was one of the uh, lines of study that uh, we had been uh, interested in pursuing uh, down the line, but as of now, we don't really have the data to say yes or no. Awesome. Okay, all right. Um, so another question would be uh, thinking about it from what other regions would you perhaps might expect this to be happening in uh, since you're not seeing this congruence between action and observation in these regions that you're looking at. Right. Uh, it's, it's tricky, right? I mean, we might expect to see it, for example, I mean, th the whole idea of this is that it should be related to motor control in general, right? Uh, because otherwise it's hard to make a claim that it's a replay of a motor plan. Um, I, uh, I, I guess the answer to that question is, uh, this is kind of most of the areas that we, would, we should expect this to be in, right? Like these are, uh, to call back to previous literature, uh, these are the classical areas that show mirror neuronal activity, uh, which is very strongly related to this idea of uh, motor simulation. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Um, other panelists, you're welcome to ask questions as well. It does, this doesn't just have to be a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions too. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually like to ask a question. Um, so you showed uh, in those correlation matrix plots, um, you showed high correlation during the wait period, but not the move period. What's the, what's the interpretation of the correlation during the wait period? Uh, so the idea is that this would uh, reflect a common visual or memory period kind of activation, right? Uh, because I didn't go over the details of the task, but what happens is uh, a light shines, the animal sees the object, uh, and from here things diverge, but the long and short of it is after a certain delay, the animal then reaches for and grasps the object. So from the time that light shines and the animal sees the object up until they're grasping, that's what this wait period is. And basically it's what the animal sees, which should be consistent, oops, it should be consistent across uh, all the different tasks. With, with the exception of the memory guided condition where the light eventually turns off, but then you have what we might call a memory, you know, a memory signal, a persistent memory of the object. Wait, um, so, we, go ahead, sorry. 
So during this wait period, how do you dissociate between the visual uh, or like the sensory ex experience and motor preparatory signals? Uh, yeah, that is certainly a very uh, tricky problem. And uh, colleagues in the lab, uh, notably uh, Benjamin Dang uh, and students that he is working with are uh, looking at methods to do precisely that. We have uh, one question uh, coming online. Uh, Saloni, Sharma, would you like to come online to ask the question? Hi, sorry, <laughs> that took me unaware. Uh, so I was just wondering what you, because in the mirror neuron research, these strictly congruent mirror neurons have been well shown in F5 where they really seem to respond exactly to the grip that they are, that they well observe uh, what how do you reconcile what you find with this previous so far established research uh so ultimately what uh i mean the the way i reconcile it is essentially how congruent are these grips grip representations really uh you know we we when, when we look in the mirror neuronal research, what we find are a bunch of example neurons and normally the very highest performing ones. Generally, these neurons are not very numerous. Uh, they yeah. comprise a very small fraction of what's going on in the population. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think what's happening is, uh, you know, very early on, I showed, you know, two peri-event time histograms that show the range of responses that we see across the population. What I think is happening is you're seeing a tail end of the distribution where perhaps uh, by chance you're seeing high congruence across the different uh, conditions. But if you look at the whole population level, if you look at what's happening uh, across the network, uh, the level of congruence between the observed and the performed action is not really so high. Okay. Uh, I just have one other question if I can still ask. Please, yes. Uh, so I'm curious about your, well, one of your suggestions uh, as your conclusion where you say there is no motor simulation in this context. So I'm just going to go very broad here and say, are you saying that mirror neurons don't exist or that there is like, yeah, or like I was just wondering what exactly you mean by that? That is precisely what would be the case if this were indeed that hypothesis, if, if that hypothesis were indeed true. But you do, there is, like you can see in the F5 neurons, especially, uh, I guess, more medially that they do seem to respond when there is a visual in during observation, right? It's not like the response isn't right. there. So it's, I, it's not that there isn't a response. And again, yeah. I mentioned that there is a component of activity that is related, yeah. that, that is co consistent across all three tasks. I didn't mm -hmm. show it explicitly, but if you look in F5 and AIP for that matter, there is a common component where all the conditions line up and you see this, this general waxing and waning of activity associated with that. Yeah. Um, it's tricky to base uh, assumptions of a motor simulation based on just that. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, it and... could be any number of other factors that are common across the different tasks, which is Absolutely. many in this case. Yeah, and the other thing is, I guess, I don't know if, because I guess you were restricting yourself to the convexity, so F5C, but if you go to the bank where F5A is, you might find more of a congruence as well, because F5A is, really seems to have both motor and visual responses, while F5C doesn't, like the percentage of uh, mirror neurons, let's say, is lower. But that's just uh, what I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if bank is e as accessible or easily accessible as convexity. Yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, one thing I will note is that for this talk, I did show two different arrays in F5 separately. Yeah. So I've been looking at trying to figure out differences between the F5 or five arrays. Yeah. Uh, you may have noticed that there may have been a slight difference between the F5 arrays when I looked at you know, population state space. Um, the tricky thing is we're not finding consistent effects, effects that are consistent across animals. Oh. Uh, so, 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 the, so the trend we see in this animal is the opposite of what we see in the other animal. Right. And how do you exactly know where to place your arrays? It's just anatomically, you're not doing any fMRI or anything. 
admittedly, I'm I'm fairly uh, new to this group, so I, I'm not entirely certain of the precise procedures. I believe it is uh, guided uh, first by an imaging study to try and figure out where to put the arrays, right, to formulate yeah. a, a surgical plan, and then, mm -hmm. you know, we enact that plan. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much for the questions, Saloni, and no uh, thank you to James for a lovely discussion. I think it's time to move on to our next speaker. Perhaps if you will uh, um, unshare your screen. Um, okay. Or thank you. Our next speaker is Lysia Munez.